I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Gary DeBoer, Professor of Chemistry at Letourneau University, Director of the Letourneau Ingenuity Center, and AAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow at the U.S. Department of Energy. In addition to career expertise in general chemistry, physical chemistry, inorganic chemistry, and analytical chemistry, Gary has developed new courses in patent law, nanotechnology, and public science policy, as well as computational chemistry and quantum mechanics. Gary has a BA in chemistry and mathematics through Calvin University, a PhD in physical chemistry from the University of Iowa, and extensive career experience in science and technology roles at the Air Force Research Lab, Ames National Lab, Pacific Northwest National Lab, the U.S. Naval Research Lab, NASA, and Gentex, as well as patent and intellectual property experience through the AMD Law Group and Brennan Manna Diamond as a USPTO registered patent agent. So, Gary, welcome. It is a pleasure to have you with me, and I want to thank you for your career of service to our country through all of those various organizations. Well, thank you, Tim, for having me here, and thank you for putting on these podcasts. They're a great, great thing to have. Absolutely. So today we are discussing what today we are discussing what you call extraterrestrial intellectual property law. I want mm -hmm. to clarify: we're not talking about little green men. We're discussing <laughs> a very important topic that you have characterized with a single question: Who owns the moon? And from what I've read, that may be a gentleman named Dennis Hope. Can you start us out with a little bit of backstory on us? Yeah, Dennis Hope, back in the 80s, claimed to own the moon and started selling property lots on there. And many people paid him millions of dollars to own property on the moon. And so the question is, you know, is that legal? What what happens when someone contests that property? And, um, you know, there are legal things to discuss here. The Outer Space Treaty of 1967 is, is the one that we cite, and it says that no nation can claim sovereignty to the moon or extraterrestrial bodies. But Dennis said, well, that doesn't include individuals. But most courts have said, yeah, if you say a nation, that includes the individuals in the nation. And so you're probably not a good idea to sell the farm and buy property on the moon. Well, Last month, New Scientist published an article entitled, International Fleet of Spacecraft is Heading to the Moon in 2024. And they stated that, quote unquote, more than 10 missions are headed to Earth's satellite, most of them intending to land on its surface and all paving the way for human lunar exploration. So space is happening right now, and it's happening mm -hmm. fast. And mm -hmm. international law is lagging in terms of ownership and IP, right? Yeah, I think so. And this is really exciting. You know, as a young person, I remember the first Apollo moon missions. And and now, you know, later in my career, I'm seeing that all that stuff that was science fiction back then is now becoming science reality. And so questions like, you know, who owns the moon and what about intellectual property rights in space? Those are all very becoming very pertinent issues right now. Space is not just something way out there far away. It's becoming closer and closer to home every day. Well, so I'm working today from an excellent presentation on extraterrestrial IP law that you presented earlier this year at the National Meeting of the American Chemical Society as part of the Chemistry and Law Symposium in March 2023. So thank you for sending that over to me. This is an amazing presentation. You entitled it uh, ET Intellectual Property Law, Current Status and Future Directory. And you started that out with Dennis Hope claiming the moon in 1980, as well as Gregory Nemitz claiming the asteroid Eros in 2000. So in the case of the moon, it appears that Mr. Hope made over $10 million selling <laughs> property on the moon. Is it legal for him to sell those plots? I mean, now you'd mentioned that it probably it's not truly legal to own property on the moon, but he could probably <laughs> sell like little... I think he's selling acreage, right, right? Yeah, yeah, he's selling plots on the moon. Um, I think the the legal opinion would be that you can sell this stuff and you can buy it, but there's going to be nobody to enforce the deed. Yeah. So buyer beware, I guess, is the word here. I think Dennis Hope is still, you know, on the loose. He hasn't been thrown in jail for this, but um, 
But again, I said, no, don't sell the farm to buy property on the moon. You know, and I'm going to come to this later. It reminds me of the the star naming registry, and that's a little mm -hmm. bit different case. Yes. But you know, it's it's one of those things that's fun to do, and mm -hmm. you know, I, I think that there are a lot of a lot of small positives to it, right? If someone can afford mm -hmm. it and they want to, I mm -hmm. I don't think anyone is probably buying acreage on the moon with the actual hope of homesteading there. <laughs> so we're probably not in trouble, but. Mm -hmm. Let me get into Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which states that outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, is not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty, by means or use of occupation, or any other means. So this was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly on October 10th, 1967. This does seem to directly preclude the kind of ownership that Hope has asserted, right? Yeah, that's the idea. If um, no nation can claim sovereignty, then no nation can enforce laws with respect to, to property rights. And that's true with respect to real estate property, but it's also true with respect to intellectual property. And that's where, that's where I was leading to in this talk. Most of us understand real estate property. And so if we can, you know, compare real estate property to intellectual property, we can see how, how they work together. One of the things that interested me reading through this was, and, and again, a wonderful presentation, you went through the timeline of legislative actions related to this. And what interested me was seeing these parallel major events in space, right? I mean, you had mm -hmm. Kennedy pushing, you know, the moon landings in the 60s. And so this was in 67, you know. Um, the next one that we'll get into here is the United Nations Moon Agreement of 1979. Again, coming out of that, that space push, you know, this time in the 70s, 80s, which clearly states that neither the surface nor the subsurface of the moon nor any part thereof of natural resources shall become property of any state, IGO, or non-governmental organization, national organization, or non-governmental entity, or of any natural person. So this this one, though, was adopted by the U.N. General Assembly, but you noted that the United States didn't sign it. Does that <laughs> still apply to us? or, or did... No, it would not apply to us, the United States would say. And <sighs> it kind of shows an evolution of thought here. Before anybody got to the moon, you, know, you could be all idealistic about it and say, yeah, it belongs to everybody. But when you actually get there and you say, hey, there's stuff here, you know, maybe it doesn't belong to everybody anymore, right? And so in 79, um, Jimmy Carter was president and he was going to sign the moon treaty and that was going to lead momentum for the rest of the world too. But you'll recall that there was an election and um, Ronald Reagan took office in 1980 and he had wants didn't want anything to do with all this socialistic nonsense, right? So goodbye, moon treaty and all that uh, talk of a, a common global good and, and things like this. That's an interesting way to express it. And I appreciate <laughs> your putting that out there. Now, there's another part of the moon agreement that interested me, which states that the placement of personnel, space vehicles, equipment, facility stations, and installations on or below the surface, including structures, shall not create a right of ownership. And the reason that interested me, the reason I was interested in this was, this seems like it would prevent staking a claim on the moon. So basically what this second part was saying was, just because you're there doesn't mean you own it. Yes, and this is another reason why the moon agreement turned out to be a failed treaty. Um, there's a difference between claiming ownership and claiming sovereignty, as we'll see as we go through these um, these legal issues. When you get to the Space Act of 2015, under the Obama administration, a Democratic administration here, but still says, yeah, we can claim ownership to these things. We just can't claim sovereignty. And so the United States has been sort of splitting hairs here with respect to ownership and sovereignty. Well, let me go into that briefly. So let's say we have a lunar station, right? And we are probably looking at this in the next decade or so, yes. you know, to a greater or larger degree. And not just the moon, but we're also looking at Mars at some point as well. Yes. So, you know, if you land capsules and you build some type of station there, you're able to say this is sovereign territory, but you're not able to claim ownership over, obviously, the entire celestial body. What about the area surrounding it? 
not able to claim any ownership or? Yeah, Tim, you're referring to 35 USC 105, which is part of the U.S. code, which says that um, intellectual property rights extend into space vehicles that are registered under U.S. flag. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you go to the moon and you build a space habitat and you register it under the U.S. flag, then all intellectual property right laws would apply in that in that habitat. You still wouldn't be saying that you own part of the moon um, because the Space Act of 2015 talked about asteroids and things. But um, you'd be sort of extend – what U.S. did is they extended their territory – into space within registered space vehicles. So the question is, if you go to the moon and everybody sets up different habitats, right, who are you going to register your habitat with? You're going to register that habitat with the country which has the least number of IP restrictions, mm, right? Because then you can do anything you want, right? So if, if you know, you have a patent in the United States, you can apply for international patents, of course. But um, if you take a, a small country like the Republic of Kiribati or something, which is on the Pacific, great place for space launching and things like this, nobody's applied for patents in the Republic of Kiribati because there's no big market there. But if Kiribati goes to space and builds big habitats and registers these habitats under the Kiribati flag, well, there's no IP restrictions in that habitat. You could do whatever you want because nobody's applied for patents in the Republic of Kiribati. So it's going to be sort of a race to the bottom, as you can see, I think, <laughs> with respect to what goes on in space, unless we have um, a larger, newer international agreement with respect to um, what sovereignty means with respect to things like intellectual property. Well, the other thing that struck me was, so if all of these are considered United States territory, I mean, in a sense, U.S. territory is all over the solar system now, right? I mean, like the new If you can enclose is... it in a space vehicle, yes. <laughs> or, or, you know, as my students would say, well, I could, you know, make my spacesuit a uh, uh, registered space vehicle, and then wherever I go, I'm operating within the United States, and I can do anything I want in my spacesuit, right? And so... So yeah, it gets a little 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 bit funny there with respect to how we're going to do these things. And so far it hasn't been a problem because there hasn't been you know, there hasn't been a lot of manufacturing in space. There hasn't been a lot of investment from private resources. But if the Artemis project goes forth as it is, you know, with respect to private investment, these private entrepreneurs want to protect, you know, their investments. And the way we've done that in the past is with patent rights. But if you can't enforce patent rights in space because no country can claim sovereignty, will there be private investment in space? Yeah. Well, and I, I think that this goes to so many different issues, right? I mean, the harvesting of resources and the boundaries on, you know, mm -hmm. again, if people are doing mining, what are the boundaries on their mining area, right? Um, I was watching the series For All Mankind, and in that one, this is a fictional scenario, but the U.S. and Russia get into it over, I believe, lithium that's found on the moon. <laughs> and then the question becomes, okay. okay, if we do find lithium on the moon, is are, are, do we have to share that? Is something that, you know, do we have to set up separate mines 20 feet apart from each other? Or is that something that one country can claim and say this whole deposit is ours? So this brings up a lot of questions. Yeah. yeah. Well, U.S. law says if, if, you're, if you can get to it and you can grab it, then, then it's yours. Now, that's U.S. law. You know, how other countries feel about that. I'm not so not so sure, right? So, and this, you know, the Moon Treaty back in 1979 was this idealistic sort of idea that, you know, everything belongs to all. But it reminds me of a lot of these um, Native American treaties that we've had in the past. You know, they're all good until, you know, we wanted something and then, then you know, we changed it, right? So, mm, okay. if we're going to establish, you know, new international treaties in space, if we're going to establish, you know, new extraterrestrial intellectual property law with respect to the sovereignty of space. I think we have to do it now before um, we do get some investment in there and things do start to happen because then it will be too late. Well, I wanted to touch on star naming, as I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so aside from ownership, there's also this idea of the right to name extraterrestrial objects. Star naming and the International Space Registry have online products that let you name, adopt, or even 
they say, buy a star. So you, you send them your money, the names are assigned to the ISR, and you get a certificate. And I should mention that they have free shipping as well. <laughs> oh, that's so, a good deal. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. for the certificate, not the star, mm-hmm. I guess. Okay. But, well, that's good. <laughs> um, so this is a different kind of ownership that's discussed in the UN treaties, right? Yes. Yes. I think that's a totally different, different topic. And that's to support, you know, the whole, um, you know, astrophysics effort and, and all these sorts of things. And, you know, even if you name something doesn't give you right to do anything with it. So yeah. it's not really the same issue. What well, the thing that interested me about that, from what I've read, I could be mistaken, but I mean, there are 100 to 400 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy alone. And from what I understand, there are just literally so many stars that at some point they said, you know what, why don't we just put this out there? As, as you suggested, there, there is, it helps support, uh, you know, funding for astronomical research. And there are so many that there's no point in not letting, letting people name them. Yes. Right. So... Room for everybody in space, yes, with respect to naming things, yeah. So you are a patent agent, and this presentation touched on inventions in space. Uh, Mm -hmm. The current U.S. code maintains that any object that is made, used, or sold in outer space on a space object or component thereof under the jurisdiction or control of the U.S. shall be considered to be made, used, or sold within the United States. So a U.S. spacecraft or space station seems to be considered to be like an embassy, right? It's U.S. sovereign territory. Yes, with respect to patent law. That's what, that's what we said in 35 U.S.C. 105. Yes. Ah. And other countries have followed that same, same lead. And an interesting case um, is an international space station because there you have several different countries involved and if you look at the iss treaty they'll talk about you know patent law and um ip rights with respect to the transport of equipment from one module to another module and then if you're just transporting it through a module it doesn't violate ip law so long as you're not using it or selling it and things like this so it's really kind of, it's kind of an interesting um treaty there and you would think that the Artemis project would be even more explicit with respect to IP rights because the whole aim of the Artemis project is manufacturing in space, to use it as a platform for going out to Mars. But the Artemis Artemis Accords mention IP only in passing, saying that we're going to work out the the matter, you know, internationally, but doesn't offer any solutions to this. So I think there's much more that needs to be done. And people are just thinking, oh, it's so far away, it's not going to matter. But as you mentioned, it's much closer, much closer than we think. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it is, I mean, you know, as, as my good friends Pete Gerritsen and Namrata Goswami have said, <laughs> it's a scramble for the skies, right? I mean, everybody yes. and their brother is trying to put stuff up in orbit, get to the moon, <laughs> get to Mars, and they're trying to commercialize it. And <laughs> and that is wonderful, but it, it's going to lead to all of these really complicated questions and if we don't solve it now lots of lawsuits right well yeah and where where would you bring the lawsuits that's the question too so you know it's much much better you know an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure is that the how the saying goes and um even though this seems like a long way off that's the time to make the rules that everybody can agree to because you know, by the time people get up there and start investing, it's going to be too late because they'll have investments. And then um, it'd be hard to take those investments back or change change the rules with respect to those investments. So if we want to promote private investment in space, um, the ISS is coming down in 2031, I believe, to re- be replaced by, you know, a number of commercial labs in low Earth orbit. You know, how are these commercial labs going to protect what they do in space unless there's some international agreement with respect to the IP that they produce. Well, speaking of the ISS, uh, Article 21 of the World Intellectual Property Law states that an activity occurring in or on a space station flight element shall be deemed to have occurred only in the territory of the partner state of that element's registry. I thought this one was interesting. You mm-hmm. mentioned um, the different HAB modules and if you transport something through, it doesn't apply. So basically what that sounds to me like is if something is developed on a Russian module, it's theirs. If it's on an American module, it's ours, right? 
with respect to IP law, that, that's correct. And that's similar to what's in the ISS treaty. So if you're in, like, like I said, if the Republic of Kiribati module, right, and you're in there, and the inventor was from the United States, but he didn't apply for a patent in the Republic of Kiribati, well, then he's got no rights to exclude people from using that device in the Republic of Kiribati module, right? And so, you know, you, so when you go to the moon and you buy your property from um, our, our friend, you know, David Hope there, and you're there, you can build your house and you can put whatever flag you want on it because um, based on that flag, you, you may or may not need to respect other people's property rights. So what flag are you going to choose to put on your house? You're going to choose a flag where there's been the least number of patents that have been applied to. And so, and that's sort of um, part of the plot behind um, the Artemis novel by um by Weir that came out not so long ago and probably be a movie coming out soon I would suspect right so mm. so these are these are well, science fiction scenarios but they will soon become science fact I believe that, yeah yeah and it's it's one day at a time it's incremental you mentioned the ISS coming down in 2031 I mean to me that's just mind blowing it I always envisioned it, that it being up there forever you know Yes, I remember uh, Skylab, Space Lab coming yeah. down in the, the 70s, right? And we thought that was a big deal. And we were thinking ISS would stay up there forever, but now it's coming down. And this is just, you know, in, in my lifetime, all these things happening from the Apollo mission to now, um, you know, projecting missions to Mars and um, all this private enterprise in space. Um, and the book, The Scramble for the Skies, that's a great book. If anyone's interested in what's happening in space, I would recommend them to read that book. One of the things that I've noticed is a lot of this, uh, the, the media gets excited about something and you'll have this blast of media stories, <laughs> right? And then <laughs> that inspires the world. And it may last for, you know, a year or six months, it may last for a decade or two. And in the case of space, there has been this long lasting media excitement, but it tends to get distracted. And it goes to other issues. You know, we've got multiple conflicts going on in the world and mm -hmm. artificial intelligence and all of that. And so people overlook things. Uh, last year, there were more launches than any other year in history. And that was the third record-setting year in a row. So it just continues to grow and grow and grow and grow, right? But it's not getting the media attention. And so us in the general public, we view this and, and we just kind of forget that it's moving forward so rapidly yes and if you read scramble for the sky you'll read about china and india and um and the, the whole the competition between um this international competition it's not just the u.s anymore going to space or the european yeah. space agency and um you know people that we cooperate with you know it's 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 you know very competitive people like china that are going to space and um how, how is that going to um change the future of space and these are issues that that are going to take a lot of effort on lots of different people's parts over a long time to work through them and um hopefully you know the public will maintain their attention long enough to um have have, have all that happen so the the space act of 2015 which you mentioned earlier was interesting mm -hmm. It states that a U.S. citizen engaged in commercial recovery of an asteroid resource or space resource shall be entitled to any asteroid resource or space resource. And there is a disclaimer that the resource may be owned, not the celestial body itself. My question there, though, is in the case of an asteroid, the what you're what you're using is the celestial body, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so. Do they just claim that an asteroid isn't a celestial body, or is that just something where we can look the other way? <laughs> yeah, you're kind of seeing the problem here. The disclaimer is actually, you know, between ownership and sovereignty. So the disclaimer says something that, you know, well, even though we may own this, we're not claiming sovereignty. You know, and, and you know, from my perspective is, well, how can you own it without being somewhat sovereign? for this thing so claiming ownership kind of implies some sovereignty but there are legal definitions to what sovereignty is and so you know they, they're splitting the hairs here and i understand why the obama administration you know put this act out they want to develop space they want space entrepreneurs to know that their investment in space is going to be able to pay off 
for them. So they wanted to pass a law that said, hey, you can have a legal right to um, sell this stuff if you go out there and get it. So I understand the motivation behind it. Um, I think that we also need to think about, you know, the, the larger common good and go back to those ideals of the original Outer Space Treaty and the Moon Treaty, which we didn't adapt. And, um, you know, think about this in a, a long-term perspective. Surely these people who invest get their investment out. But maybe there should be, you know, some part of that investment that goes to the, the global commons, right? And um, how to think about how we do that so that the benefits of, faith, of space benefit everybody, not just those who have the wealth to get there, to get more wealth, but it helps us redistribute that those resources to all the people of the world so it can be a, a good thing for everybody. Yeah, as they said, for all mankind. And, and yes, yeah. those are high ideals, you know. And it'd be nice if we could um, work toward living up to those things. That would be that would be a real achievement if we could. Well, speaking of global commons, I want to touch on the presidential order of 2020, which says the <clears throat> Americans should have the right to engage in commercial exploration, recovery, and use of resources in outer space, which is legally and physically unique domain of human activity. And the U.S. does not view it as a global commons. And th then it goes on to say that the policy of the U.S. shall be to encourage international support for public and private recovery and use of resources in outer space. Now, I read that as saying space is open for business. Would that be a fair summary? Yes. And I think it's a, it's a clear denial of the Moon Agreement of 1979. So, you know, Ronald Reagan didn't sign the Moon Agreement in 1980, but now we have you know, Mike Pence, who was very much behind the Artemis Project and the Artemis Accords and this, you know, and the executive order of 2020 saying, hey, not only are we not agreeing that the moon is a global commons, we are, you know, saying it is not a global commons or taking the exact opposite perspective here. And again, you know, I understand the motive here is, hey, we want to make sure that investors are able to get something out of their investment. I just ask, you know, well, maybe we can do that while still protecting and rep respecting the, um, the idea of space as a global commons as well. Yeah. And that makes complete sense. And uh, to me, this brings up, I mean, maybe we can apply some of the, the principles of seafaring nations, right? Yes. Where, you know, the right to transit and things like that. And then <laughs> once you arrive, then you get into kind of a different set of rules and laws. <laughs> uh, there was a single sentence in your slide deck that summarized this. I read this and I loved it. It said, if you can get to it, you can own resources of a celestial body while not owning the celestial body. To me, that says it all. <laughs> yeah, that's sort of where things are right now. So unless unless things change in the future, that's it. So if you've got the money, if you've got the rocket ships, you know, go for it now. Why you got that window open, I guess, is um, what we're saying is, you know, business is open right now and there's no restrictions. So um, you don't have to pay any revenues to anybody else right now. So go and go and get it and grab it while it's while it's hot, so to speak. Yes. I want to throw in a speculative question. I always try to add at least one. In this case, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, what happens if our lunar, Martian, or asteroid colony declares independence from the Earth? And to me, that parallels the Declaration of Independence in 1776, <laughs> right? I mean, it sounds like science fiction to have your Martian colony revolt. Right now, mm -hmm. that sounds like sci-fi. But mm -hmm. you know, a couple hundred years ago, that probably would have sounded like sci-fi in the new world. So Yes. Actually, I, I think with respect to intellectual property rights, that would be a fine thing. You know, if you had a, a sovereign entity, you know, whether it's a lunar sovereign entity or a Martian sovereign entity, you would then have some place where you could apply for intellectual property rights. Yes. There's been talk already of um, making sort of a, uh, internationally defined um, space that not one country would be claiming sovereignty to, but internationally we would claim a sovereign space where you could apply for patent rights to. And um, that, that's sort of talk right now. But if there were a sovereign entity in space, they could then you know, establish their own patent office and you could apply for, you know, 
IP rights or trademarks through that sovereign entity. And it wouldn't be a sovereign entity from Earth. It would be the sovereign entity in space. And that, that would solve, you know, all the IP questions that way. So I think eventually there's probably going to be a transition from an internationally declared, you know, space territory that you can apply for IP rights into that would be managed by, by WIPO. And then eventually when, you know, those space territories become independent, have the infrastructure to support their own offices, that then the, that international community would turn over those responsibilities to that, that home world, that sovereign entity in space to handle those IP rights. Well, Gary, thank you so much for your time today. It has been truly a pleasure and an honor speaking with you. This is an enormous issue. We have really just barely scratched the surface of it. And let me thank you again for sending over that amazing slide deck. That was so helpful to be able to work from. I mean, there's a lot of law that's already there. And as you pointed out, there's a ton more that needs to be developed. So I, I appreciate your focus on this topic. You have raised some really important issues. I want to close by asking, what is coming up for you as we get into the 2024 year? And do you see this topic moving or changing in the near future at all? Well, I'm at the Department of Energy now on AAAS fellowship, as you mentioned, set on a sabbatical from my home institution at Laterno University. Um, one of the projects I'm, I'm hoping to encourage here at the Department of Energy is looking at DOE space assets. I'm calling it the, the extraterrestrial energy challenge. Now, you may not know, but the, the ISS space station was actually a, a U.S. national lab. Mm -hmm. And so when, when it comes down in 2031, the DOE will lose that asset, so to speak. And so the question is, well, now is a question to ask, well, what, how will DOE look at space with respect to energy and, and everything else? And currently, it looks at space as a way to support Earth projects, Earth observation, um, ways to optimize solar and wind energy and things like this. But we need to, I think, in the future, look at space for space. You know, how do we develop energy in space for space? You know, how do we um, protect those assets in space for space? Because, of course, you know, space is related to what happens on Earth, but we also have to look at space for space itself. And so I think that's sort of um, the transition that I'm trying to get the DOE to look into here in the future during my time as a fellow here with the Department of Energy. Wonderful. Thank you again so much for your time today, sir. Well, thank you, Tim.